Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the HR Exchange Network. You're here with me, Rhiannon Chaladay, your conference director and host for this online event, Corporate Learning APAC 2021. Now, before we get underway, just a quick reminder. If you have missed any of our sessions prior to this session today, don't worry, you're going to be able to watch that session or all of those sessions back on demand for up to a month after the event and you will receive information on that. Now, just a quick reminder of what you can see there on your screen. I'm going to kick off by mentioning that resource centre. Now, any materials that you see in that resource centre, please do take advantage of it. Those materials are there for your benefit, so do download them for future use. Now, we want to make this session as interactive as possible. So we've got two functionalities. One is going to be the poll engagement sessions, a couple of those throughout our presentation here today. And then two is that Q&A function. So any questions that you do have for Rajiv, pop them into that box and hit submit. And we'll get around to asking those questions at the end. Now, if you do want to carry the conversation on also after today's session, feel free to connect on LinkedIn with Rajiv. And as I mentioned, carry that conversation on. So without further ado, our third session of the day here at Corporate Learning APAC, building data smart organizations through data literacy. I'm delighted to be joined by founder, CEO at Nelscape, Rajiv Jayaraman. Rajiv, it's a pleasure to have you here today. So I'm going to hand over to you and uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Ree, and thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this very important session on data literacy. In the next few minutes, uh, I will be walking you through what it takes to build a data smart organization through data literacy. Did you know that 90% of world's information has been created in the last two years? And we are already outnumbered in terms of connected devices. If the human population in the world is roughly 7.4 billion, the number of connected devices on this planet has already exceeded 22 billion. So we are outnumbered by a factor of three. We are literally swimming in an ocean of data today. And the organizations that will be successful in the future are the ones that are able to harness the power of data and convert this data into business value. But before we get there, I would like to quickly introduce ourselves as an organization. Nullscape has this mission of helping organizations and leaders become future ready through experiential learning. We fundamentally believe that traditional learning models are falling short in the digital age. We need a breakthrough approach that accelerates employee transformation and builds digital mindsets at scale. We do this through two value propositions, one for the learner where we create immersive simulation-based learning experiences. And for the organization, we do this at scale and we are able to harness a lot of talent intelligence and we are able to create a dashboard for the organization. And this approach has been widely regarded in the industry. We've been consistently winning Brandon Hall Awards, mentions from Burson by Deloitte, and we are a global top 20 gamification company. So that's a quick snapshot of some of the simulations and immersive experiential courses that we offer uh, on digital transformation, leading change, leading teams, design thinking, agile, database decision making, to name a few. And these are some of the brands that we have worked with globally. We work with 300 plus leading organizations across 75 countries, and we have strategic partnerships with top tier B schools and consulting firms. And in a given year, we touch close to 400,000 learners. And as you can see, uh, we work with a lot of global multinationals across various geographies. So this scales globally really well. Now, Focusing on building data smart organizations through data literacy. I'm going to uh, ask you a few questions to see if uh, you're tuned into what's going on. Do you know how regularly Amazon changes its product prices? I'm sure all of us have used Amazon, uh, the e-commerce platform, and we have regularly bought products from there. Do you know how regularly Amazon changes its product prices? The options are, every week, every day, every hour, 
every 10 minutes. Go ahead and answer this question. Once you click an option, you can click on the submit button. I'm going to give you a second to answer this one and I'll move on to the next slide. Can't wait to see what your responses will be. All right, I think that's a good enough time to answer that question. I'm going to move on to the next slide to show the answers. All right, so what I'm seeing here is every week, 33.3%, every hour, 33, and every 10 minutes is 33.3%. And in fact, the right answer to this question is Amazon regularly changes its product prices, and it does so every 10 minutes, right? And if you think about what does Amazon base this decision on? Ultimately, product prices are directly proportional to the revenues you make and the profits you'll be making, and they are changing this every 10 minutes. What helps them or what enables them to do this is their massive storehouse of data, right? They are able to... Um, get all of this data, they are able to process this real time in an agile fashion and based on um, you know, the trends that they are seeing playing out in the marketplace, they are able to change the pricing. This is so fundamental uh, to their revenue growth and that's how effectively they've been using uh, data in their decision-making process. Now, moving on to the next question. An organization that leverages data and analytics to understand customer behaviors can outperform its peers by what percentage in sales growth margin? So we've got four options here, 85%, 70%, 50%, and 40%. So here the question is, organizations that leverage data and analytics to understand customer behaviors can outperform its peers by what percentage? Eighty-five, seventy, fifty, or forty. All right, I'm going to give you the answer to this one. All right, so what I'm seeing here is eighty-five percent. You know, twenty percent of the audience seems to think it's eighty-five. Eighty percent of us think it is seventy percent. Now, the right answer to this one is it's eighty-five percent. So this comes from McKinsey Research. They say that eighty-five percentage is the advantage you get over your peers if you're able to leverage data and analytics. There are multiple case studies out there that sort of um, explain how this happens, be it the Netflix case study where they um, invested $100 million on the House of Cards show based on the analytics that they were able to generate on their platform. Moving on to the next question, if we know that these are great benefits of being data literate and data savvy, what stops organizations from being data smart? Right, I have four options here. Obviously, all four of them are right in their own way. I would like to know what you think is the number one reason that stops organizations from being data smart. Option one, lack of data quality or lack of quality data. The second option is lack of employee skills. The third is company culture, and the fourth is difficulty in accessing data. Please go ahead and answer that question. Lack of quality data, lack of employee skills, company culture, and difficulty in accessing data. I can't wait to see what comes out of this one. All right, so you've got a pretty good mix here. Lack of quality data, 33%, company culture, 33%. Um, pretty good. So you see all of them are playing a role in uh, companies or organizations. Uh, you know, they're preventing organizations from being data smart. But what research shows is that lack of employee skills seems to be the number one reason uh, why most uh, people, when they are asked this question, especially in um, uh, organizations across various industries, lack of employee skills is coming out as the number one reason, followed by lack of high quality data, right? You could have highly skilled people, but if you don't have great quality data, like they say, junk in, junk out, right? That's the story about data analytics and uh, data architecture. So that's uh, what is stopping organizations from being data smart, employee skills. And that's a problem that we are trying to address uh, through our solutions at Nullscape. Now, 
the way we look at data literacy, you know, while we build data literacy in various organizations, we say to be data smart, an organization needs to build these three things. One, how do you incorporate data in your decision-making process? So that's your first pillar. The second pillar is, do your people, uh, are they well-versed in visualizing data, making meaning out of data? And the third element is storytelling with data, right? It's not just about the left brain. We need to be right brain as well. The ability to narrate a story that is compelling and uh, one that actually initiates action. So database decision-making, data visualization, and storytelling with data. Rest of my presentation, I'm going to focus on these three pillars and give you a flavor of some of the frameworks that we use to uh, help organizations become data smart. So we will start with data-based decision-making. Now, we all know that decisions that we make uh, in the real world, right? Uh, these decisions are made sometimes based on data, but most times it is based on uh, what the industry calls as HIPPO. HIPPO stands for highly paid person's opinion. We seem to differ defer to um, an experienced person's opinion while we are taking decisions. It has um, you know, biases built in to the uh, decision-making process. And guess what, HIPPO, I hear, has already been uh, replaced by ZEBRA. ZEBRA stands for zero evidence, but really arrogant. So uh, most of our decisions that we make in our organizations uh, tend to be biased. So we need to bring in uh, more method to the madness, but we all know that using data and analytics can effectively drive business growth. As we've seen in the poll earlier, 85% is the advantage you get over your peers. Operational efficiency, effective customer engagement. Today we live in an omni-channel world. We need to collect data to see how customers are responding over multiple channels. Product or service improvement, marketing effectiveness. As you can tell, digital marketing has completely been transformed using data and analytics and effective people management within the organization also is becoming very data driven. So there are multiple use cases uh, within the organization that we need to care about. Now, before we talk about higher order things, we need to get some basics out of the way. Now, there is a difference between data, information, and insight. Oftentimes we tend to use them very interchangeably. Now data, very simply put, is raw, granular, and distinct. What do I mean by that? As I mentioned earlier, there are 22 billion IoT devices today surrounding us, the so-called intelligent devices. These devices are producing data 24 by 7 by 365. These data points are raw. They are not processed. They are granular. They are coming in um, at a very granular level, temperature data or um, you know video processing data and so on. And they are very distinct. They by themselves are not revealing a pattern. But when you process that data and you organize it, you store it, and there is something that is explicitly stated about that uh, information where you start labeling things, it becomes information, a little bit more useful compared to data. And finally, insight is when these random pieces of information get connected in a way that you are able to make sense and it becomes actionable where you're able to take decisions and it gives you a rational framework, right? So while we speak a lot about data literacy, I think the end game here is not just raw data, it is the process of converting data into valuable information and from this information to be able to derive insights that can lead to decisions and those decisions lead to outcomes. As you see, there is, um, a pathway that we need to follow here from data all the way to decision making, right? So this is a data value chain. On the left, I have data and information, and I have decisions and outcomes on the right. Is there a missing piece in the middle, or do we think this is sufficient, data and information? I just shake the jar, and I pull um, a chit out of it, and I get my ideal outcome. Is that what's going on? Obviously not. There is an intermediate step, which is all about insights and visualization, right? Good decisions are made when key stakeholders arrive at right insights, often aided by data visualization. 
Why is data visualization important? Today, as I mentioned, 90% of world's information has been created in the last two years. So we are flooded with data. The ability to visualize this data, connect the dots appropriately, derive insights that can lead to great decisions and outcomes is what we need. So there is a missing piece in the puzzle today. While we talk about data, we talk about decisions, there is a critical missing piece in the middle that we need to focus on. Now, I want to start with database decision making, right? So we call this at Nullscape the glamour framework. It is very glamorous, right? Um, it's all about converting data into value. Now, glamour stands for goal. That's G in glamour is goal. L is livers. A is analysis, metrics-based decision, and review, right? Now, before we can actually use data for anything, we need to know what the goal is, right? Sometimes we follow an emergent process. We look at data, try to find the proverbial needle in the haystack. That approach is difficult. Instead, if we have a goal in mind, revenue optimization or you know, supply chain optimization, whatever that business goal is, if we can work backwards from the goal, right? From the goal, we derive the levers that can impact the goal. From the levers, we do the analysis by gathering data. We look at different ways of uh, doing analysis. Then we apply some metrics to understand what are some right approaches. And of course, this is an iterative process. We need to do review at every stage. So that essentially is the Glamour framework for data-based decision-making. Very quickly, G in Glamour is goal. Here, it's really a business problem statement that we are starting with. Gain a clear idea on the problem to set your goal. If we don't have this right, if the key question is not in place, right, uh, we cannot find the answer. It's almost like going to Google without a question or some idea in mind, right? And Google cannot really help you. It's like that, right? So we need to have a clear business problem statement. Levers are essentially the factors that impact the goal. We need to be able to drill the goal down into contributing factors. That's essentially levers. And once you collect data for the different levers, we obviously can start doing analysis. When you talk about analysis or analytics, there are four major approaches that we can speak about. A couple of them are backward looking, descriptive analytics, the ability to describe what has happened and diagnostic analytics, which is all about figuring out what has gone right or wrong, right? So that's essentially backward looking. When we speak about forward looking, we start to predict what might happen next. And we can also get into prescriptive analytics, which is all about providing a solution to a problem statement. So there are these four different analytical approaches that we can speak about. So we are done with goal, we are done with levers, we are done with four types of analytics. Next one is metrics. So the idea, the outcome of analysis is, let's say an insight from the data you've generated an ins insight. But how do we know what decision is going to yield the right outcome for the organization? For that, we need to start thinking about metrics, right? From a customer engagement standpoint, a lot of organizations think in terms of NPS scores, net promoter scores, right? Or it could be uh, employee satisfaction score, you know, having that cutoff or threshold saying, I need to be more than nine on 10, whatever idea gives me that outcome is the right insight, right? So we need to have metric-based uh, approaches to decision-making. So here we define the criteria, determine the weight for each criterion, right? So this could be price, time, quality. So based on these different parameters, you can give weightages for each one of them and put all the ideas through this filter to arrive at the right uh, decision that yield the right uh, that will read yield the right outcome. So that's GLAM. Now R is review. Database decision making is a continuous iterative process. It's not a one and done process, especially when there's so much data coming at us 24 by seven. So here we are measuring the progress, we are understanding the impact of the solution, and we are also identifying the side effects or new issues or problems that arise. So that's a glamour framework. I hope you're able to see the relevance of this in your own um, area of work. Now I'm done with database decision making. I'll move on to the second element, which is about data visualization. So 
the first approach is all about a, a sequential iterative kind of process, but at every stage in that process, we need to be able to visualize that data to make meaning out of it. So data visualization is a graphical representation of data and information through the use of charts and graphs. A study by American Management Association has found that visual language shortens work meetings by up to 24 percentage. Wouldn't we all love that? Having shorter, more productive meetings, right? So that's the power of data visualization. Getting data visualization right is no joke. We have, we have all seen bad charts. We've all seen bad graphs. We've all seen bad infographics where it ends up confusing you more than providing you with clarity. So effective data visualization has these four different distinct components. One is data representation. Are you able to take this raw data and represent it cleanly? Are you able to drive visual clarity? Somebody looking at um, a graph or a chart is able to understand it with great clarity. Data interpretation. When you're looking at data, are you able to interpret that data in the right way? And are you able to build insights from whatever has been presented? So these are the four essential components of data visualization. And we can further drill this down. Data representation is about the style and the rules of data representation. Visual clarity is all about decluttering, providing annotations that will make it easy for a reader to understand what's going on. Data interpretation, the art of reading graphs, numbers to statements, are you able to convert a visual into a one-liner, so to speak? And uh, insight building, how do you derive insights out of what you're seeing, which will enable decision making? So data representation must be contextual. So there are different kinds of representations. You will see comparison, distribution, composition, relation, and so on. We all need to learn how to present raw data in a format that makes sense. So I'm done with database decision making. I've touched upon data visualization and what goes into it. Now, the, the right brain element in all of this is storytelling. Today, we have a lot of charts. We have a lot of infographics. But if we were to narrate a story with it, right, that will appeal to human emotions, ultimately leading to some kind of a call to action. That's where storytelling comes into play. Now, there are different things that we need to pay attention to when we are converting data into a story. Who am I telling the story to? Classic, right? Uh, we need to understand uh, who the audience is. Why am I telling the story? What is the purpose or the insight that I want to convey to my audience? How do I make this story believable? Right? That's where data comes in. Can I present evidence with data? And how do I make the story engaging? The choice of visualization, the style, decluttering, all of that stuff that we've spoken about earlier makes your story you know, compelling. So data visualization must be a visualizer must be willing to start afresh and create new representations when needed, right? Every data point or data source has a story hidden in it. We should be able to look at it with a new pair of eyes every single time. Now, I'd like to pass this on to my colleague Amrita, who is going to uh, walk you through how do you exactly enable data literacy and how do you use experiential learning for the same? So now we will... Uh, walk you through the Nolscape way. Over to you, Amrita. Thank you, Rajiv. And thank you for bringing it out so beautifully that later data literacy is not about just core rough data. It's about database decision making, about data visualization and storytelling with data. Thank you for doing that. Uh, now, what am I going to talk about to you today is how Nolscape works with you uh, as an organization to enable data literacy in your organization. Uh, our combined effort, that is us together, uh, Nolscape and you, is to make an effort towards creating a culture uh, of database decision making at all levels within your organization and inculcate a data centric approach that leverages analytics effectively to achieve business outcomes. These two are keys to be able to enable our leaders who can derive more value out of data and analytics. Uh, that is always available in organizations, right? Today, organizations have a lot of data, but are they able to derive more value out of it? Uh, we will also work with you to encourage objective assessments of possibilities, performance, results through data analysis, which was one of the core things that Rajiv also spoke about. 
Um, ensuring transparency in the organization uh, is very important and that's only possible by building capabilities around the use of data for all decisions. So how do we propose to do it? Um, is it going to be through a single course? Actually, we believe that uh, you should bring together an entire journey that leaders should go through, uh, which is a combination of various courses that aim at uh, discussing the fundamentals of data for business, let's say. Uh, the second could be leveraging analytics to solve business problems. So when Rajiv was talking, you must have noticed there's quite a lot to take in. So it is best to compartmentalize it and focus on one problem at a time. The second, uh, the third one that we have is to be able to visualize data and derive insights. And the final one is about then finally using all three of these to make effective decisions. Um, our courses are based on our three-pronged learning strategy, which is to learn, reflect, uh, and apply. Uh, the right order would be to begin with learning. So just as you saw, we actually gave you the concepts first. In our learning, we make sure that our course gives you all the learning that is necessary, all the concepts and context that are necessary for you to be able to apply it in real life. But before you go and apply in real life, what we do for you is actually give you our simulations. These are safe spaces for your leaders to go and actually practice without burning their hands uh, as to what can I do? Can I leverage analytics properly? Uh, okay, if I take this kind of a decision, what will be the outcome? And um, it's safe because while there is a lot of interaction within the simulated world, you're not really burning your hands at work. The final part of any learning should be reflection, and we do it through a performance report. Um, when I come to uh, describing the two simulations uh, that will help you enable this journey, uh, data and decisions and data viz, I'll also take you through the reports so that you understand how we help every learner as well as the organization reflect on how the performance is. Has the needle moved? Have they been able to recognize areas that they need to work on? So let's move on to our first simulation in this cohort, which is data and decisions. Uh, we propose uh, to provide a platform, as I initially said, to experience uh, what data-enabled uh, decision-making is all about. Uh, people can get their hands dirty by actually taking decisions in the sim. And it inspires the team members and leaders to create a culture of data-based decision-making. So what is data and decision simulation? Well, it is a place where you or the learner, let's say, would take on a role, and their main objective would be to bridge the gap between business and data analytics teams. I think today this is the biggest gap that any leader needs to bridge. Um, Neither of them are complete in isolation. We've already seen data literacy is really, really important. So during the simulation, the participant will have to practice data-based decision-making. Uh, their decisions would have to be informed. They will be solving problems. And they'll provide necessary recommendations by leveraging data analysis. The different approaches that they use, they will be using it to actually provide within the simulation uh, the necessary recommendations to the organization and take decisions for the organization. Um, moving on, I'll actually take you through the uh, sim itself, a few um, screenshots so that you can actually see how it feels like when you are a learner. Uh, before we do that, uh, here are some learning outcomes for the learners. I think what is really important is the business outcomes for an organization that chooses to use data and decisions. Uh, it helps build a strong culture of data-centric decision-making at all levels in the organization. It's not just for leaders, it's for everyone, because I think leadership begins at the bottom. It will help improve business performance by taking objective database decisions, and it will create a robust business model that is capable of navigating challenges through effective data analysis. Uh, why don't we take a closer look at the simulation itself? Uh, this is uh, to give you some feeling of what the learners will go through. In data and decision simulation, your organization is relying on you to practice database decision making, you being the learner. As you can see, the sim has certain objectives uh, which the learner is supposed to take care of. You're placed in a position of, uh, you're placed in a squad by the CEO of the organization, and you need to solve problems, business problems, by practicing database decision making. 
your role in the squad is very very specific as uh, a player you act as a bridge between the business wing and the data wing so if you can see uh, what we have in the simulation is an entire cohort of people as per the organization structure there's a data wing and there's a business wing and you need to bridge this gap you need to aid decisions right uh, using analytical approaches that you're aware of you also need to ask the right questions and define the problems unless you do that there's no way you're going to solve the problems finally you also need to derive insights and stay aligned to the business outcomes at all times let's take a closer look at the org structure as i said you can see there's a business wing and a data wing you are in the middle you are in the part of business development and you'll be bridging the gap so how do we uh, how does a learner actually take decisions or go through uh, various things uh, in the simulation we have two prong strategy you will be working in a virtual world because it is simulated it is a simulation uh, and you will be receiving emails and you will be a part of conference calls the way we always do right we always do it in our organizations as well we either receive emails with a problem or we get into conference calls. Here's a sample uh, of a situation that you may receive in an email. So the organization is trying to target pregnant women uh, with suitable recommendations and promotions. That's the main aim that they have. So the first problem that is thrown at the player is who should be our target audience? I think that's a question we ask in our organizations as well, right? We have a product to offer. Who's our target audience? And you as a player is going to choose one of the options shown above to actually say after looking at data that hey let's target on uh, the customers in section 1 or 3 or in the section 2 which segment are you going to target on you also have conversations uh, where you will be um, taking decisions and uh, you will be presented with options as you can see there are four distinct options and these actually replicate the way people respond after looking at data you may believe that hey uh, the best products should be, uh, the best way of positioning your product should be by going 100% natural. In this case, the player is saying, uh, let's use the strategy where best discount possible banner goes out in the self-care category. Now, every decision that you take has an impact, right? So in our simulation as well, you will be able to get feedback immediately from your colleagues that are uh, trying to uh, arrive at a decision with you. Now, what are simulations if there were no constraints? You always have constraints in real life as well. There is always a cost to your decision. There are constraints that you work with in timelines. And as you can see, the gamification part of the simulation is designed in the same manner. Uh, on the top, you can see there's a clock. There's a limitation to the time within which you're supposed to take decisions. And you will get responses to see how you did. If you can see this conversation, the decision taken by the player is immediately responded by uh, Irie, she says that, hey, I think what you're suggesting is not the best thing. We should go for 100% natural. So there is a proper dialogue which is happening in the simulated environment for you to recognize how you're doing. On the top, you may also be able to see this is an analysis accuracy meter and business focus rating. These two measures actually keep telling you how are you performing in this simulation while playing? Are you be able to analyze accurately and are you being business focused or not. Now, the meaty part lies here. Once I'm done with playing your simulation, what do I understand about my performance? This is where user reports come in. At the end of a simulation, every player gets a personalized report. The overall score is on the top. And as you can see, it goes through a 10 point scale, which tells the player if they were in the range of being novice, that means there's a lot of work that they need to do on themselves, or are they all the way up to being proficient or role models. The objectives of the simulation were there while you were playing, and you can see your analysis accuracy is actually dependent on you being competent at problem def definition and using the right approaches to analysis. If you fail at any one of these, you will not be able to be accurate in your analysis, and the report very clearly shows that to you. The second part was business focus rating. Now, if you were business focused, you would have been competent at being driven by insights and you would be very, very outcome oriented person. And this report, therefore, forms a part of the reflection that I was talking about. How have I performed? How have I done? What are the areas that I need to improve upon? 
work upon so that I can be better at database decision making. The second product that we have uh, for you in the data literacy series is data visualization or data viz as we call the simulation. I've already told you it's a simulated environment in which uh, the learners can experience various problems and find solutions for them. And it'll inspire the learners to absorb key principles, right? Raji was talking about uh, how charts are very important, how you are able to read them or not. And then they'll get to absorb the key principles and best practices by actually make, either making correct choices or making some mistakes, but in a safe environment. Let's take a closer look at this particular simulation. Um, Sorry about that, there's a bit of a lag here. Uh, so what's the story? Well, the story is simple. Uh, there's something called as true fashion inclusive and it used to be a boutique and now it is converting itself into a multinational, multi-channel fashion outlet. While it was a boutique, it was doing very well, happens with a lot of businesses. But since it has taken up this massive task of becoming a multi-channel multi fashion outlet, its business is not doing that well. So here you are, in this organization and you are supposed to help the organization deal with this problem. In the simulation, you will be focusing on two key things. Are you a visualization star? That means do you have the ability to read, interpret and represent data in various visual formats? As we saw, these various uh, visual formats will contribute to the second part as well, where there's an uh, insightometer. It will be your ability to enable your task force to arrive at the right insights. So if, if you're able to visualize well, you are able to derive insights better and take better decisions. The format would be similar. Uh, you would have, uh, because it is a virtual game, you would have inbox uh, messages that come to you, emails, and you will have conversations as well. Here's the first email for you to take a look at, right? Uh, so there's somebody who wants to pick your brains and they want to know, hey, uh, I want to showcase numbers. How do I do it? So to help you make a choice, you would get four different options, right? Four to five options. You could use a line graph. You could use a pie chart. There are multiple things that could be available. Right? We have this habit of using PPT to its best uh, PowerPoint presentations. We are grained, ingrained towards picking as many graphs as possible. But what is the best choice in this case, do you think? If you are showing trends, uh, which one should I use? Once you make a choice, you also get an immediate feedback. So in this case, the player, at least I have chosen to go for uh, a line graph. And as you can see, Alina, who asked me this question, is actually happy that I use this. And she's saying it is ideal for the purpose. So in data visualization, it is very important. What are you going to use to visualize and help me come at this? So you're getting an immediate feedback. Conversations uh, are built around asking the right questions and giving the kind of insights would be necessary for people to arrive at proper decisions. Coming to the last part, uh, which is, again, the part of reflection, is your report. Uh, you're a visualization star if you're competent at data representation and you provide a lot of visual clarity. You are an insight master if you interpret data well and you give insights that help build better insights and take better decisions. At this juncture, users will be able to, again, think about, hey, where is it that I lack? Where is it that I really need to work hard? And what are my strengths? If you are a wonderful visual uh, visualizer, you may still have to work on generating insights that can help take decisions. So this was about the two products that we have on offer. Uh, beyond that, uh, our talent intelligence doesn't stop at just uh, user reports. Uh, we have a three-pronged strategy. Our talent intelligence touches the product, the platform, and the people. At product level, you have simulation reports, as I showed you, and gameplay insights. During the gameplay as well, you were getting responses and you saw how you're doing or not doing. Competencies and behaviors are co uh, covered in the report that is generated towards the end. At a platform level, because we provide our courses, which is an amalgamation of, as I said, learn, reflect, uh, learn all the way to reflect on our platform, 
you are able to see as an organization what was the learner activity and performance like. You can actually see number of people taking the courses, how well, uh, how much of the course have they completed. You can also track along with insightful uh, metrics that we give on our platform, which will help you actually focus on those people that need more help and be able to think about those people who've done really well and what next can you do with them. At a people level, every organization is worried about uh, actually classifying on the basis of demographics and norm groups uh, that how have we performed. That's where benchmarking comes into play. Uh, our reports are not limited to just the people, uh, can be as limited as the cohort that has uh, come to the learning session or can also expand to beyond organizations. So you can actually see where your cohort stands. And group and batch analysis is something that we do along with you. Uh, we spend time on it and help you arrive at better insights about the cohort that has taken the course with us. That brings me uh, to the end of my presentation. Uh, Rajiv, would you like to take over? Thank you, Amrita. Thank you for walking us through uh, the two products and our approach towards um, talent intelligence, helping organizations build data smarts at scale. Now, we have a few more minutes. If you'd like to ask us any questions on the presentation we have done so far, we are happy to answer those questions. Um, now, starting off with a question that I see here on my panel, um, how are these products uh, delivered to the learner? So essentially, that's a great question. So the, essentially, these uh, can be consumed by the learner in a completely self-paced format. There is information given to them on the concept. There is a gameplay, simulation gameplay, followed by the debrief. It's a three-part structure. And this course can be delivered either self-paced or live virtual. It can be instructor-led virtually. It can be in-classroom instructor-led, or this can be the train-the-train the model, uh, train-the-trainer model if you have trainers in-house in your organization. So we support all these four delivery formats. So I hope uh, that answers that question. Um, second, how is this uh, gamified simulation-based methodology different uh, from the other forms of learning? Firstly, this uh, methodology of, of using simulations and gamification makes learning an active process. It is unlike watching a video on the screen, uh, right? It could be even from one of the topmost B schools uh, or technical schools in the world. Um, you know, just watching a video doesn't build skills. Whereas when you are immersed in a simulated environment where you take decisions and you're, see, you're shown the results of your decisions and you're able to reflect on what you have done, that's when uh, skills are built, right? And this is what we often say, you see on the screen, to experience is to learn. Everything else is just information. Today, you've got a lot of information out there, but what makes insightful learning is experiential learning. So that's what is different about what we have presented uh, today. And uh, let me see if there are more questions. Feel free to ask me questions on the Q&A box. There's a question on uh, building mindsets. I think that's a that's a good one. So uh, in terms of building mindsets, right? that's the hardest uh, thing perhaps in an organization, uh, whereas technical skills can be built right through objective means. For building mindsets, we need to do something deeper. right? And that's where experiential learning once again comes into play, where we place the learner in a safe learning environment. We have them take decisions. And through those decisions, we show a mirror back at them saying, hey, this is where you stand on data readiness or digital readiness. So that becomes an important um, you know, methodology for unlocking newer mindsets. And we are able to do this at scale because the same experience can be scaled up to thousands and thousands of people. And yet we, we are creating a personalized learning experience. I hope that answers that question. Let me see if there are more on the chat window. Yeah, there's a question on uh, the future implications of personal data with the rise of uh, Web 3.0. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Now, they say data is a new oil, right? There's, uh, there's a reason why people say that, because uh, oil is, is a valuable resource. And, and I'm not surprised we are comparing data with oil. But the problem with oil also is that it is combustible. It, it, is, it can explode. 
right? And same thing with data. While data is valuable, if you don't use it well, it can explore um, and create problems for the organization, which is why data governance is an important topic that we all need to get our heads around. Uh, data privacy, data security, all of these are fundamental things that have to be done around data for this to yield any results or value, right? Otherwise it's going to blow up in our faces. Right, I think we are at the top of the hour. Let me pause here. Uh, if there are any final questions, be, feel free to ask us. Otherwise, you can reach out to us, uh, follow us on uh, LinkedIn. You can reach out to us uh, at insidesales at nullscape.com and there are contact uh, details available on the screen. Please do reach out to us if you thought this was interesting. Thank you all for the participation. I hope this added a lot of value to you. Over to you, Reed. Thank you. Rajiv, thank you, and Rita, for that brilliant session. So we are, well, we have come to the end of this session. So audience, um, stay tuned. We're going live in another 15 minutes' time. Click that call to action button there on your screen. Join now. That will take you straight through to the next session. Just a quick note, you will see resources in that resource center there on your screen. Feel free to download any of those resources for future use. Do take advantage of that. Now, if you don't get around to clicking the join now button, don't worry, you will receive an email with a URL. Click that link and I'll meet you there going live. We'll be looking at programmatic learning, digital digitally driven programs for high impact transformation. I'll meet you there, but without further ado, I would just like to thank Nullscape, Rajiv, and also Amrita for joining us here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amrita. <laughs>